I didn't know you went to the University of Singapore. You didn't know? Hi, Mickey. Okay, I think we should we shall start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Warren Lecture Series. Today's lecture, as a previous one, would be given by one of our colleagues, Professor J. Liang Li. Uh, he joined our department in 2010 after uh, doing his PhD at Northwestern University. And prior to that, he got his bachelor degree and master's degree from National University of Singapore. And I think he works mostly in uh, fracture mechanics, probabilistic methods. And I will not take any more time. Just uh, let's welcome the speaker. Uh, thank you, Sonia, and good afternoon. It's a really great pleasure to speak in our lecture series. Uh, today, I would like to talk about our recent work on a fairly traditional topic in structural engineering, which relate to progressive collapse, collapse of RC buildings. And many of you know that uh, my work is mainly focused on scaling of quadrupedal fracture. So today I would like to deviate from that past, talk about something different. But again, still RC structures. So concrete is still a, a main thing. And before uh, I start, I would like to acknowledge my collaborator, Mr. Bing Xue, who is a PhD student in my group and sitting there. And uh, most part of this work was done by him. So. Um, here is the outline of today's talk. I will start with the background and motivation. And I will talk about uh, a new stochastic model we developed to address this problem. And then I will talk about the application of this model to RC buildings and compare that result with the current method, which is the mean center analysis, which is essentially deterministic calculations. Then I would like to talk about the recent extension of this method to a simplified energetic equivalence analysis, which allow us to do reliability-based optimizations. And finally, I want to make some concrete remarks. So progressive collapse. Um, we usually define progressive collapse as a large-scale structural collapse due to a propagation of local damage. And that propagation is gravity-driven, purely gra gravity-driven. Uh, there are a few notable <coughs> incidents of this uh, failure type. The very first one, which is well documented, is the Rodan Point apartment in UK in 1968. That is the explosion, a gas explosion in the kitchen on the 18th floor. And uh, this is, uh, let me just point, yes. So, so somewhere here, a gas explosion happened. And the precast panel damaged, and it caused the collapse of this corner bay of the building. And this building was demolished after that, and a new Roman Point apartment was built. And uh, since then, in the 70s, in British, Great Britain, 
Um, BS code has already considered the progress collapse as a one of the key considerations of building design, but not in the U.S. at that time. And the second incident I want to point out is a new World Hotel in Singapore, 1986. This is a before collapse, this is a collapse after collapse, a total disaster. And this was due to a miscalculation of a load by engineer. It caused such a disaster. In the U.S., of course, we may not, may not be familiar with this, the Mural Federal Building, Oklahoma City, 1995. A terrorist drove a vehicle with explosive to the first floor, and it wiped out uh, half of the buildings. And then recently, of course, the uh, total disaster was in the towers collapse. And uh, such a collapse really caused a significant financial losses, human casualties, and uh, for these kind of cases also create a profound societal impact. So in social engineering com community, we are very interested to understand how building behaves under such a uh, failure scenario. So let me start with some overview of what we have done in this field. Of course, the first group analysis is really using simplified analytical approach. And uh, this is a work back to 2008 I did with Bajan on the analysis of a Washington Tower collapse. And the feature of this building collapse is the, big, the crush front is throughout the entire floor. And the building is tall enough, so you can really uh, write down the equation for the motion of the crush front using a one-dimension continuum model, and uh, you can solve it numerically. It's not that difficult. However, this kind of analytical approach only limits to one-dimension model. You cannot extend that to two-dimension or three-dimension crush front. It's impossible. So it's very limited, but it's very efficient. You can really solve this uh, you know, using Excel sheets sometimes. <coughs> the second approach people start to look at is experimental approach. Of course, it's possible, but it's extremely expensive. And we don't do much here. In the U.S., what we do for experimental approach for process collapse is typically trying to monitor a country demolition for some building we do not want. And uh, that's a group at Northeastern University, Sasani's group. What he did is that he always tried to look for buildings that are going to be demolished. And then they try to put an uh, explosive somewhere and look at how the building behaves under those kind of control demolition con condition. In the laboratory control test, um, uh, I'm only aware of one test done by NIST. This is in 2011. It's a two-dimension frame sub test. Uh, later, you will see this experiment. Uh, it's a very neat experiment, but it's a large scale. It's very expensive. Uh, recently, in China, they start to look at the three-dimension frame assembly test under some collapse, collapse behavior. But uh, uh, the reason is that we want to look at the effect of slab on the behavior of the, those buildings. But uh, as, I, uh, as I said, it's very rare to do those kind of tests because it's just way too expensive. So that leaves us no option for us to look at this except numerical simulations. That is the major research efforts <coughs> to understand the behavior of buildings. So uh, the first type of building is full-scale FE models. This is a group in Michigan. What they did is that they discretize the building into finite elements, basically, full finite elements. And they just look at the 10-story bu building collapse. And for this one, one simulation takes about 60 hours just run this kind of thing. Fully nonlinear. It's nonlinear, dyna dynamic. And uh, at uh, Switzerland, ETH, uh, Professor Herm Hermann's group, they use a discrete element model. Basically, they discretize slabs and beams and columns using spheres. And uh, there's a nonlinear spring connect between those spheres. And of course, you can imagine this model probably is more expensive than that one. And of course, we want to do efficient simulations. So that comes out of some what we call a macro element model uh, developed by UC Davis. Uh, basically, what they did is that they used self nonlinear springs as the beam column joins. And these springs are uncoupled. So one spring damage does not affect the property of the other sp springs. And these sp springs are calibrated from the material property of uh, reinforcement and the concrete. And, uh, all these models have some common features. These, these models are all developed in a determinist framework, which means we cannot quantify at all the collapse risk. So if this model shows you the collapse pattern like this, you will never tell at what, what probability it will fail like this. You have no idea about this. And uh, because of this, all the design methods against progressive collapse are all de deterministic. We do not have any reliability concept here to design structures to target at uh, a uh, tolerable failure risk, for example. We don't have that. By contrast, for the earthquake engineering, wing engineering structures, 
we all have this concept called reliability-based design, but not for this type of failure. So this really drives our, our work to understand, uh, can we develop a model that can understand the collapse risk of a building like this? And uh, that kind of framework was proposed before, but uh, there's some difficulty that uh, people do not pursue further. Uh, that is by the NIST report and mainly uh, uh, effort by Bruce Allenwood at Georgia Tech. Well, basically it says the total collapse risk of a building can be computed as a product of three terms. The first term is the uh, probability of a hazard, the H. The second term is that the, what is the probability of a local damage due to the hazard, H. The third term is that the, what is the probability of the collapse due to the local damage. And that, you multiply them together, you get the, the probability of the failure of the building. So the probability of the hazard, PH, uh, you can estimate from the occurrence of the hazard. Uh, typically, one in <coughs> 1,000 or lower. And uh, this data you can get from FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. For example, gas explosion is about the one in 1,000 rate. So you uh, roughly know this number. Then this during the life of the entire building? Or the entire uh, one building? year. Oh. One year. The occurrence of uh, local structure damage, this value we typically we take as one because the structure is not designed for a hazard like this. So once a hazard happened, we assume the local structure damage will for sure happen, happen which is con conservative anyway. Then let's just jump to the left hand side of the equation. The tolerable risk of a building we want to design target is one in one million for normal structures. For some special structures, this number is much lower. For example, Freedom Tom in New York City this number is much lower than one in one million. So in that sense, we hope that our building can be designed such that for given local damage, the collapse probability should be in the order of one in 100 or lower. This is a target failure probably want to de design against. But however, there's no model currently for us to evaluate this number because the model is just too expensive to run for the, uh, the probability of the collapse due to local damage. And that leads to the motivation of this work. We try to develop an efficient numerical model to evaluate this number. So um, that leads to a, maybe a broader question is a reliability based analysis of structural system. So what really we compute now is really the class probability of a building for given damage is nothing but the probability of a union of all the possible failure sequences that can lead to the collapse extent. So we try to calculate the probability of this event. And this is a difficult, very difficult to compute because for large scale structures, you have so many possible failure se se sequences and uh, it's difficult to find the probability of the union of those sequences. So in structural engineering, what we do is that we try to approximate that by selecting what we call a significant failure se se sequences. So we try to get rid of those minor ones which contribute very little to the probability. So we want to search which as star which is significant failure sequences. And uh, so we try to compute this probability instead of looking at the exact number. So uh, in this study, we again, the focus of course to compute this number. Uh, we try to develop a computational efficient model by looking at two things. The first uh, aspect we want to look at is that we try to reducing, we try to reduce the search scope for uh, significant failure sequences which means we have to predefine failure location, possible failure lo lo locations, so that we do not really need to exhaust all types of uh, failure sequences. And uh, that is actually essentially leads to what we call uh, reduced order modeling. The second aspect we want to pers pers uh, pursue here is that we want to compute efficiently the probability of each of these failure sequence. Because for full scale simulation, you will expect nonlinear dynamic simulations. We want to simplify this so that we can efficiently compute the probability of each failure sequence. So these are two aspects we want to focus on, and that leads to our work. So I started with this two-scale stochastic simulation, which really addressed the first part, which is really a reduced order modeling. So um, this model is really um, analogous to what we know in, frac in fraction mechanics what we call cohesive model. In fraction mechanics, we use a cohesive model to represent a finite size of a damage zone at the prep tip. Here, similarly, what we do here is that we consider, for example, a frame structure, a beam, and the columns, 
And we predefine the possible location of failure of those beam uh, columns. And those green spots <coughs> is a potential damage zone. In the modeling, we try to use a cohesive element to represent the behavior of those zones. The rest are linear elastic, which means the failure will never happen in these gray spots. <coughs> the failure can only happen in the red spots. So how to select those spots? So for beams, typically we place in a quarter span, which allows a single curvature, double curvature bending. For column, we put at the two ends of the middle span that resembles the Shirley column model, basically. And uh, of course, these are cohesive elements like this. Uh, the key point here is that how we determine the property of this cohesive element. Uh, this cohesive element behavior must be calibrated from a physical behavior of a damage zone which have a finite size. Uh, this is the key difference from this model to a model of cohesive fracture for materials. In material fracture with a cohesive element where property is a material pro property, so like fracture energy or so on and so forth. But here, the property of this cohesive element is a structural property. It depends on material properties and also depends on the geometry of this zone and the size of this zone. And that is the key point of is the calibration of this model. And by doing this, we capture two land scales at least. The first is the size of this zone. The second is the characteristic size of fracture of the concrete inside, so which is the prep bandwidth basically. So you have to capture these two land scale right, so you can get the correct uh, behavior of the cohesive model. Uh, so for slab and walls, so for slabs we consider that uh, the plane damage zone lies on the yield line. Typical yield line, this is the beams and the columns here, this is a slab. And for wall we use a recent trust model and uh, we, rep we rep represent the trust model in the cohesive element. And uh, to match the mesh compatibility, we basically this is the cohesive element for slab and walls. All right, so now we want to look at how to formulate the behavior of the cohesive element in a mathematical form. So what we did is that, of <coughs> course, this is a finite damage zone that we want to model using cohesive element. We separate this zone into two parts. One is the effective concrete section, which is concrete plus transverse reinforcement. The second part is the longitudinal reinforcement. So the traction separation relation for the cohesive element is written in this form. You have two parts. One is the traction due to from the effective concrete sec section here, and the second part is the reinforcement. And the row is a reinforcement ratio. So it's two parts. So now let me start to look at uh, talk about how we determine the function for the effective concrete section. So what we did here is that we have to capture mixed mode fracture because this con this concrete sec section can subject to both normal and shear at the same time, most likely it will. So what we did is that we start to formulate an effective separation, which is more or less a vector sum of the normal separation and shear. And then we can compute the effective traction, which is work conjugated with this W bar using the principle of virtual work. And then you substitute the W bar in this e equation, you can compute the following. So the key idea is that I do not need to know the relationship between the separation and the traction in each direction. The only thing I need to know is what is the relationship between the effective <coughs> traction sigma bar and the effective separation w, w, w bar. So I want to search this function f. And this search this function is difficult because it's highly nonlinear and it could be very difficult to compute this. But the good, not, the good thing is this. For collapse behavior, for overall collapse behavior, the only thing important is energy dissipation. That's the key quantity that determines the overall collapse, collapse behavior of the building. I'm not talking about each element or look at the structure as a whole. And uh, based, on this, based on this, actually we just use a very simple bilinear law. And this is analogous to what we always do for fracture mechanics. It's not important, if we only want to know the peak load of a specimen, it's not important to know what the real behavior of the post-peak. The only, be, only important part is the energy under, under this curve. And of course, if you want to do, you want to match low point displacement point by point, then this curve is important. Similarly here, we are not interested in looking at the motion of the structure when each element fails point by point. What I'm interested in is that what happened before the cohesive element failed and what happened after cohesive element failed. 
because the entire behavior of the building will consist of a number of cohesive elements. So you sum them together, you can roughly obtain the good approximation of the collapse behavior. So mathematically, of course, this curve it can be written in this linear form. And the peak and uh, the displacement is related to the cohesive law in the normal and shear direction. So here is just a sketch, a rough sketch, looking at the mode mixity. So if we have a combined normal and shear direction and the traction will, the effective traction space will look at this blue triangle. And if you use this to project back, you obtain what is effective in normal and shear directions by this formulation. So this uh, can really effectively cap, 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 uh, to capture the mode mixity in combined fracture. And for reinforcement, it's simpler because it's a one dimension, typically. So we can utilize what we know about stress strain curve or the reinforcement, but the only modification we need to make is the bound slip. So what we do here is that the total strain in the rebar at the bar, bar force, sigma and s, is equal to the reinforcement stress strain relationship plus a bound slip number, delta s, which is bound slip. The bound slip is depending on the bar force. And uh, the Berkeley group and the University of Washington group, they have already obtained the, the functional form for this based on assumed stress distribution along the interface between the bar and the con uh, concrete. And uh, then you can really compute uh, the, uh, the cohesive be behavior for the long zero reinforcement. And of course, uh, the next part is the loading unloading. I have to admit that we use a very simplified loading unloading behavior because we, accept, we expect for collapse behavior, you will not be unloading to the or origin. So uh, what we did for effective concrete sec section in effective stress separation space, the so unloading points to the origin, which is, I have to say, simplification. In concrete, we never get this kind of unloading behavior. But we know that for collapse, the dynamic stress oscillation will not go down to here, but maybe somewhere here. So this is approximately good for that. For longitudinal reinforcement, loading unloading is a classical plus plastic model. There's uh, nothing new here. Then calibration. So how we calibrated this model? Well, I said we have to calibrate this simula uh, this property from a physical simulation of the damage zone, which captures size, is very important. So what we did is that for effective concrete section, what we did is we put in tension, numerically, compression, shear, which determines the cohesive behavior in those three modes. Then we do a combined tension plus shear, compression plus shear, to get the more mixed parameters. And that you lump into a single cohesive element for this damage zone. And uh, for simulation for this, final element simulation for this, uh, we use a damage plastic model developed by Fenness at Berkeley, used by Berkeley, now UT Austin. And the reinforcement that we use is a bilinear kinematic hardening model. And the mesh size in this model is about uh, 50 millimeter, which is about two to three times of aggregate size. We fix mesh size. The mesh size does not change because we want to use the private model, basically. And uh, yeah, so this is how we do the calibration for the effective concrete section. So we try to validate this model against some experiments. So this experiment I've mentioned bef bef uh, before by NIST. Uh, this is a full-scale RC frame sub-assemblage. The test was done at Purdue, I guess. Uh, this half span six meter. So this is total 12 meter span beam. The column in the center removed and they pushed down. The, they've pushed down until this thing failed. The total deflection on the mismatch is 1.2 meter in test. So this is uh, only one test has <laughs> such a large deformation. But, uh, okay, so basically we try to use our model to see whether we can predict the behavior of this. So, okay, this is the de design of this experiment. So we use the first of brute force finite element models. So again, Krebam model tells us that the mesh size for this have to be 50 millimeters. It doesn't matter how big the specimen is, it must be 50 millimeter mesh size. So it's huge amount of FEM simulation uh, elements here, which again we use the plasticity or uh, damage plasticity mo model here. And this is our two scale model. So we have you can see a cohesive element in the quarter span, and uh, 
you just push down. So the positive element is calibrated by the model, the calibration method I talked be before. And uh, here is the result uh, of the relationship between the force you applied and the displacement you measured at this cent the center span. And you can see uh, the response is fairly nonlinear. So let me just take a minute to explain what is going on here. So you start with a linear elastic, reach the peak, uh, softens. The softening is due to the crushing of the concrete at the mid span on the top, comp crushing here. Then you will still increase deformation, and this crushing will go down. But if the deformation is large enough, these two beams actually become a truss. So that is what we call canary action happened. So it really pull. If you if, if you think about this loads going down and this two like a truss with intention, so it's going to hardening due to reinforcement. And in the end, the reinforcement ruptures, so everything falls apart. So this is the nonlinear behavior of this model. And both models can capture this pretty well. And uh, you can see the area under this curve, which the energy you spend to collapse this thing, is captured pretty well. But the difference between these models, of course, is computational time. This is several hour, hours. This is two minutes. So we save a tremendous amount of time in com simulation time. Okay, so now I'd like to just apply this model to RC buildings, uh, some RC buildings. So the first one is a fake one, which is, we designed it. Uh, 30 story, two dimension frame. Uh, and uh, 30 story, and uh, this the, the design is, our, well, I should not we designed it, is the design is uh, very close to what the NIST had for their prototype of frame. So, uh, in this case, we want to do soccer simulations. So the material property is random now. So the material properties for concrete and reinforcement are totally random. So a normal distribution for the strength, Fc prime, Ft prime, and the reinforcement, the yielding yield and out, the ultimate force is random. And then what we did, of course, now we have to, in the lower scale, we have to do so quite simulation for the behavior of those potential damage zones. So here is a realization, different no color with different numbers, of course, for Fc prime, Ft prime. Here again, I want to point out one thing is that uh, in this presentation, we did not consider auto correlation lens at all because the mesh size is about the prep band width, and the previous work showed that uh, the prep band width in concrete is almost the same as auto correlation lens. So each of these blocks has independent prop properties, so it's not auto correlated. So from this, you can really compute the distribution function of the cohesive par parameters for the cohesive element that represents this. And uh, one thing to mention here, these properties are partially correlated. They are not independent, because this comes from this model. So partial par is, partial, is partially co co uh, correlated. You can compute the correlation matrix for these properties. And the loads, uh, loads can be random too. So super simulation, we come with a load combination 1.05, dead load plus 0.3, life load, that is suggested by Allenwood. And for dead load, we use the uh, Normal distribution, Gaussian, COV 10%, uh, life load, normal distribution, COV 60%. In the meantime, we also want to do determinist calculation for this building, which we follow Department of Defense recommendation, DOD, which is the only recommendation existing now for this kind of calculation. In this DOD, what they use is that they consider mean material properties. And the load combination is 1.2 dead plus 0.5 life. So actually, they try to use this low factor to account for the randomness of the material properties and loads. So let's see the results. So of course, we put this in simulation framework. With Dakota, which is software to do sampling of uh, cohesive resistance and the loads. For cohesive resistance, of course, it's partially correlated. We should not have transformation to transform it to uncorrelated first. Then we sample using latin hyphen cube sampling. Then through the Python interface, it goes to Abacus, which is the main vehicle that we use to run simulations. In Abacus, if one, if one cohesive element failed, we delete it, and the debris can impact the other structure components. The contact algorithm we just use in Abacus, which is the simple penalty method in normal direction and the friction in shear direction. And after Abacus simulation, you go back to Dakota to register the result. And based on that result, that Dakota will know which will be the best next sampling point. So in this case, actually, we are doing what we call incremental Latin hypercube sampling, which is a type of adaptive sam uh, sampling method. So here we identify 
four possible collapse extents. One is intact, which we take a column, the rest is okay, nothing happened. Local collapse, if I take some column, this part of collapsed, but the collapse front does not penetrate. Partial collapse is that these two bay are gone, but the rest part structure is okay. Total collapse is everything is gone. So let's take a look about uh, one realization, give you some idea what's going on here. So we are taking out a column at the 16th floor. So, yeah, okay, so it is gone, and the upper part starts to collapse towards the lower part and penetrate all the way down, and the debris start to push this building towards the right, but the rest part is okay. But this is just one realization. And uh, second realization can show that this whole thing can totally collapse because debris can damage the lower part of the structure here, and uh, then you have a crush up mode here. So, I mean, the video is nice, but it's not important. So the most important is this result. <laughs> so we try to delete the column at different floors. So first floor all the way to 29th floor, one at a, one at a time. So if you look at the probability of the building being intact, it increases from 63% all the way to 99.1%. It's just obvious because at the lower upper part, the momentum is not large enough to push this thing down. But uh, the key point I want to mention here is looking at the, the last two cases. If we look at the current room at 26th floor and 29th floor, the probability of being not intact is about 6.6% uh, and 0.8%. And the determinants calculation using DOD recommendation tells us the building is intact. That means the DOD recommendation cannot capture anything failure risk below 5%. So if you want to design a building against 5% failure risk, DOD, is not, it, DOD method will tell you that the building is okay. But actually, it's not okay because it fell at a failure probability 5% or lower. So this tells us uh, that for critical structures, if you want to ensure a very low failure probability, the current DOD method is not sufficient. The second example I want to talk about is a 10-story RC structures. This is a real structure. Okay, it's uh, designed by some firm in the U.S. I won't say which one, but uh, it is a real structure. It's a 10-story office building, and uh, is a framework structure and the parameter and the flat slab system in the middle. And uh, so we try to do that. Same thing that, uh, of course, we try to do some model validation for slab and walls, because we never did that for slab and walls. So there's no experiments here, but uh, we just do simulation with full FEM simulation for slab and the walls, uh, and the, the loading he here and the, the shear on the wall. And this is the cohesive, mod 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 uh, cohesive element model we have, and uh, they are pretty similar results. So I think it's good enough. And then we look at uh, simulation of collapse. Again, we look at uh, both scenario of uh, column removal and a wall removal at different locations. So. This is another video here, look at the wall removal, but it's just, you may see that, uh, so this is the wall removal at uh, fourth floor, this part of the wall column removal. So the collapse is more like a pancake shape, so this whole thing going down. The so failure is due to punching shear, because it's a flat slab system, the punching shear failure. This is a one realization again. And uh, the second is a column removal at the first floor, these two columns are rem removed. And again, this is a band here and the uh, punching shear failure. So um, again, the results shows us if we have a failure probability 0.5 percent, uh, the decision calculation cannot capture that because this is really low. But on the other hand, I think we can learn something from this calculation is that you may realize that I do not have almost anything in partial collapse. Everything is total collapse or intact. And uh, this tells us something. If you look at the design of this building, the slab thickness here is 10 inch. It's a very thick slab. And uh, because the slab is so thick, actually the slab is able to redistribute the load after column removed. So actually the slab is designed uh, to have an uh, uh, alternative load pass. But on the other hand, as the punching shear failure, the joint is not ductile enough to account for those forces. And uh, that causes the so slab tried to distribute forces to the entire building, but the building is not designed for those forces. That's why everything collapsed. That's why total collapse. And that leads to a very important consideration in DOD recommendation. In DOD recommendations, they always think about tying force. They want to use a tying force to create alternative low pass. And the recent work at NIST found that uh, 
in order for tying force to work, you must have very ductile joints. So, so beam column joints should be ductile enough to account for those large deformations from the tying force. And this, I think, is a very good point, and our simulation basically uh, confirmed that point because uh, if you have a very strong slab which creates an alternative low pass, but the joint is not ductile enough, you may end up with pull everything down. So in that sense, you may better off to put some sacrificial pad, uh, components in order to reach the partial collapse <coughs> instead of total collapse. And uh, so the con conclusion for this um, part of study that we show that the dynamics calculation, which is by DOD, is sufficient for a collapse risk maybe 0.05 for given, given damage. If we want a lower risk level, then I think a probabilist approach is a must. You cannot avoid that. Uh, and then I will talk a little bit about uh, the real the recent development, try to extend this to some energetic equipment analysis. Uh, this work is really motivated by the fact that we want to do design, not only analysis. So, uh, progressive collapse is something additional to normal de de uh, structure design. For example, we design structure for gravity load, earthquake, or wind. Progress collapse is something else. So very likely you need to strengthen the st structure component to account for this. So the DOD design recommendation defines a failure as any non intact condition. So in DOD, basically they lump together the local collapse, partial collapse, and total collapse. So actually the structure design against the collapse is leading basically to a reliability-based optimization problem, which can be written in this form, the simplest form I can write, is basically I want to minimize the cost of a structural component such, so that the collapse probability is PT, which is a prescribed num number. And this number could be very low, can be one in one million, can be one in 10 million, no? you, pre you prescribe a number. Here, we want to find a way to strengthen the structure so that the cost is minimal. This is one way to look at this. And to solve this problem, you end up with a double loop optimization problem. What you did is that you will try to optimize the structural properties an outer loop, so that this can be min minimum. And at the same time, you want to check whether the probability risk is PT. What do you do that for each trial for the property, you need to do so called simulation to compute PC. And that forms the two loop calculations. It's typical what we do for reliability based op optimization. And this is extremely expensive. Because if you look at this, I will need to use the two scale model to do simulations maybe 100 times or 800 times. And this is 20 times, so total you are looking at, uh, I don't know, just, just two lines, no way to do it. So in this view, that uh, we think that our current model is still too expensive to do this. So we want to simplify that more. And that leads to this energetic-based uh, model. So the one way to, to reduce this cost is try to say, I have a totally nonlinear behavior of cohesive element. Is there any way that I can remove the nonlinearity? I use a linear elastic element, and I still can capture the failure risk. Is there any way to do that? So that comes uh, some idea, try to develop what we call energetic equivalent linear elastic cohesive element. So the idea is try to replace the nonlinear cohesive elements by elastic elements with some effective elastic properties. So let me just explain it. It's very simple. Uh, but then let's explain in just a single mode fracture. So let's say normal load. Say this is normal load. So normal traction, normal separation. The blue curve is exact nonlinear behavior of this cohesive element. Now what I do is that I want to make a equivalent elastic element represent this red line, okay, elastic. The stiffness is determined in such a way that at the actual collapse separation, the string energy stored in this elastic element would be the same as the energy you spend to collapse the actual cohesive element. And if, if you do this, you can use energy criteria to judge whether the element fails or not. Following this, we can define a load to resistance ratio of the cohesive element as a mu, which is the string energy of the elastic element and the loading divided by the actual energy dissipation uh, of the cohesive element. So G is determined from the nonlinear. I mean, the two-scale model, but the U is nothing but uh, you compute the strain energy of the elastic element. So in principle, in calculation, this uh, the elastic 
element can go forever because the linear elastic. But the mu value should be very, will be very big. And uh, of course, we want that mu must be less than 1 for the element not to fail. And uh, then we try to compute this using this method to compute the failure risk. So in, in this case, we try to separate the random load from the resistance. So we use a conditional sampling, basically. So FL is the probability density function of the load, and the PFL is the probability of failure of the structure due to the, due to the load L, for given load L. So this integration is nothing but expectation value of PF slash L. Numerically, we just compute the mean value. So now how we compute this number? So we compute this number, which means it basically is the risk of a collapse for a given load. So what we do is that we start to sample the resistance, which is the cohesive energy, and that de determines the elastic stiffness here. So for each realization, we start with linear elastic structure analysis, because everything is linear elastic now. And for, each, for that, I can compute the load resistance ratio for each element, mu i. If any mu i is less, less bigger than 1, which means that element will fail. If it is all mu i is less than 1, which means everything is OK. So no collapse will be found. If any mu i is bigger than 1, then we will delete the cohesive element with the maximum value of mu i. And then we can check. After delete the cohesive element, we need to check whether the stiff matrix is singular or not. If it's singular, the stiff structure becomes unstable. That means collapse is found. If it's not, you can st we will redo the structure analysis after deleting this cohesive element. And you again compute the remaining mu i. Then you just do this loop. And from this, you can, you can see every step is a linear elastic. Of course, you need to do it multiple times, because if your failure sequence has a multiple con uh, con uh, if your failure sequence consists of a number of cohesive elements, you need to do these loop for many times. But every time, you do a linear elastic structure analysis. And then you implement this in the code, and this is the result we have. So uh, this is, again, this uh, three dimension. The, the second e example, look at two column removal at different location. This is what we had, the two scale nonlinear sequence simulation. This is what we have in the energetic equilibrium analysis. So risk we computed is a slightly higher. It's higher than the one we have, but it's a reasonably upper bound. CPU time is much, much less. We talk about if the location one, CPU time is about one quarter. But at, if we look at the 10 story column, column removal, it is about uh, I don't know, 2% <coughs> also. And of course, the CPU time for nonlinear sequence simulations for non intact condition is almost the same, same because we stop the simulation once we see the collapse start to go down. Uh, so it's a, almost the same number of nonlinear non, non elements involved. But CPU time for e equivalent analysis is drastically going down if we remove column on the upper floor. This is because the number of cohesive elements for failure sequence become less. Basically, I have a less loop to do here. And uh, this tells us, uh, this simulation basically says that the, equivalent, uh, the energetic equivalence analysis can significantly de decrease the computational time. But at the same time, it yields a reasonable upper bound of a failure risk, which is conservative. And the reason I have upper bound is nothing but we totally ignore the force re redistribution mechanism in the s structures. Because it's almost brittle, because I go to here, if I found mu is equal to 1, it's just de deleted. So there's no force redistribution, and there's no ductility in the structure we use. That's why we get upper bound of the failure probability. In another way, the resistance is a lower bound. And so that's, um, so I think that this is good enough that we can implement it with the optimization using reliability based optimization for double loop. And uh, so let's bring to the conclusions. So I think we developed a two scale sequence model that uh, can efficiently evaluate the collapse risk of the RC buildings. And at the same time, um, this model can be expl uh, extended for simplified analysis for evaluating the upper bound of a collapse risk. That, in my view, is a key step towards uh, reliability-based design op 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 uh, optimization. And uh, um, we also believe that this model can be still extended to other hazard loadings, for example, fires. And this actually we did in my group rec rec uh, recently. What we did is that we consider cohesive element is not only dependent on mechanical load, also thermal dependence on property of cohesive elements. From that, you can really 
looking at uh, how the building behaves under fires. And of course, you can more elaborate load for the loading and loading condition, you can look at earthquake simulations. And uh, probably more than that, we can combine different hazard loading, look at the post-earthquake fires. So personally, I believe this model has a great potential to look at the hazard loading on the structures, and uh, it provides us a very physical-based model to compute the risk of a structure and the loading. So by this, I end my talk here, and uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for questions. I have kind of an algorithmic question for yeah. you. Um, so it seems to me, uh, sort of a naive understanding of what you're saying is you sort of fail one part and then sort of look at the probability of other things failing essentially, right? And That's right. Great. Does the order that you look to see which element fails matter? Um, and so I'm guessing, I mean, you look nearby, but you, you're sort of moving in three dimensions, right? Oh, and we so search the entire building, not only nearby. Okay, so you search the entire building and you might find that something is likely to fail. Um, and then what do you look for next? Or do you look for everything failing all at once first? No. So you mean this method? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I did is that uh, if you look at one failed, all right, what do you do? Basically, you always delete the element with the largest load to resistance ra ratio. So you cannot delete elements simultaneously. Because in that sense, basically, this is not actually correct because in the real structure, element fails sequentially. So you cannot delete at the same time because it changes stress distribution. So you always delete one by one. And you always delete the worst one. Okay. There's, ne there's never a tie or anything? I don't think so. <laughs> right? No, no. I don't think so. Um, it's very elegant, but okay. my question is, when you need to compute this EC, right? EC. This, as well this as one. the point where the WC or EI... Which one? This, this one. No, the, the point where it stops. This? No, 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 go back. You, you were in the right place. Middle picture. Middle picture, right? yes. So that EC determines where... EC determines the so energy... So how do you compute that? Because that's, okay, so and how do you compute WCO? Is that, is that dependent on oh, the oh, problem? Or? No. G, I, and, oh no, I say, here EC. Is say EC, right? It's yeah. coming by this equation, basically, right? right? So the area, and this must be an area under this blue curve. Right. The blue curve is determined from, from, let me back, from this simulations. So, but you do have to do the simulation you before have to you do know it. it. Yeah, you have to do this, a uh, five-scale model, you have to do it. No matter, what, First, yeah. no matter what, then you can compute, yeah, you can compute that in the host scale model. Okay. So, so it's really case dependent. It is. It is case okay. dependent, and uh, every dimension zone will have different value of this GC and the WC. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank so, you. Yeah. So you at the beginning had an effective failure rate of one in a hundred thousand. Does it? Ex Early on, yeah. Uh, so how how do you decide what that should be? This one. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> on the soft side, it depend is actually determined by insurance company how much they pay here. Because that depends on this num number. I design a building, let's say one in one million. I get ins ins insurance, and this is how much they want to have. Of a client, we know they know this. But this is a typical number that we use for buildings. So somebody is guaranteeing that that's the probability? Oh, well, by right, should guarantee that probability. But uh, I don't know whether the real design guaranteed this probability or not. But that is a How target. does the insurance company know that that's what that number is? They set this number by premiums. How do they, and how do they know what your probability analysis of failure is, <laughs> given that that's what their, their I, threshold I, is? I, I, I have no idea on this. But uh, I think... Uh, uh, this is said by the tolerable rate you know, of the fa failure of a structure, for s s structure, and it tied with the, ins the insurance. But on the other hand, for structural viewpoint, uh, this is a commonly accepted num is number. So I don't know who said this, but uh, this is uh, what we used. So I, I think my question actually is 
very similar to David's question, which is, this is all nice, but if I'm going to design a building, I can't go through all of this every time I want to design you a building. You cannot. So what's the big picture? So for members, we have key <laughs> factors and I low think factors. So wh wh where does this go? I think uh, um, discount analysis only applies to some structures. You cannot afford to do this for all buildings. It's impossible. And uh, when I work in industry, I know some structures, high-rise buildings, which have some critical you know, impact, they require to do this by the client. So it's not required by ACI or ASCE. <laughs> it's not re re required, I have to say. But if you look at that structure, like a Freedom Tower, now you worry about the collapse. Then I think uh, with this kind of magnitude of structures, this analysis is needed, in my view. But not, definitely not for all structures, just some critical ones. <coughs> Your model was expired, uh, inspired by uh, cohesive elements. Yes. Uh, but one of the problems with uh, cohesive elements is that they kind of weaken the structure and they drive cracks in certain locations. Yes. Do, do you have the same type of problems? And just a second, uh, if you have, let's say, if you double number of, cohe of cohesive elements. Sorry, you have If you double number of your... Oh, we tried element. that, yes. Okay. So, okay, let's go to the first question. Yeah. Cohesive element does drive the direction of crack. But as I said, this is not a conventional cohesive element. I do not drive the crack go like this. What really happened is that I have nothing but want to use this model to represent behavior here, which is diffused crack. It's not a single crack here. It's diffused crack. So I want to lump the smear diffused crack to a single model. So I would not agree to say that uh, this cohesive element basically say the crack will go up like that. It doesn't mean this. The meaning is this, that you have a damage here, which means you have some damage in this cohesive, you know, in this finite zone of the damage, which could be shear crack, could be compressive crack, can be ten tensile crack, which I capture that through uh, FE simulations. The second point, very good. How about I double the number of elements, and we try the ones very expensive, and the probability does not change much. So convergence is guaranteed. So in that sense, I believe personally that these locations does reflect significant failure sequences because otherwise we will have a difference be, 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 uh, between this and this, right? So I think we already obtained the reasonable estimation of the failure sequences here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I want to I want to challenge what you and Carol just agreed to. <laughs> I agree. I just Okay. <laughs> no, you, you made the statement can't. I, and I want to challenge you. So it's 400 hours on a computer. Who cares? Huh? Why can't we? Why shouldn't we be requiring this type of analysis if we're looking at a failure on the order of one in a hundred thousand or one in a million? You're right. You said, but that's per year. Yeah. And maybe there's a million structures that we should be analyzing. So it's okay to have one of these things collapse and only kill a hundred people. You know. <laughs> I, I, why is it okay to not require this type well, of analysis? I will you not convinced say, me at the beginning I say it's good. I, oh, I'm not saying it's not. Uh, I'm not saying this is not required. I mean, I will not say anyone will require to do this. Why not? Well, the first thing is that, uh, I mean, from a very practical view, view, viewpoint, is that you should think about the cost involved to this analysis. How much the margin the engineering firm can earn to design a structure? It's minimal. If you afford them to do this, I don't think. Everyone has to do it. They just raise their rates collectively. That's not an economic problem. Oh, but that's only happened for some stru special buildings. Now. Now, yes. But if, if it were required, every firm would have, would every firm David, would have can to I, can I get, <laughs> can I repeat you? Oh, maybe, uh, okay. <laughs> maybe yes, but uh, the whole industry, the margin has to be changed. The profit margin has to be changed because well, this. No, the profit margin wouldn't change because this would be an increased cost of all firms to do this if this were required, and so it would be built into the cost structure of every firm. And and there might be a slightly more expensive engineering work, so there might be slightly less demand, but it wouldn't be significant enough to matter. Four hundred hours on a computer is nothing today, and next year or a year and after it'll be two hundred hours, and the year after that it'll uh, be fifty hours. But uh, 400 hours, I'm talking about analysis of one case, just one case. But if you want to design optimization, you are talking about uh, at least half a year, you know, just 
do a simulation, half a year just get a design optimization only for one location of column removal. That's a super expensive. I don't think any firm can yeah, afford to do this. You don't have to do every single column. You don't have to do every you don't. single column in order to analyze the. the no, no, basic you don't. I mean, you, I mean, you, I mean, here is that you can choose, you know, uh, different locations, right? I mean, here I just choose some, you no, know, some maybe possible one because the, the ground floor of the vehicle can hit, you no. Know. I mean, you kind of know the critical lo 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 locations, but on the other hand, I think this is really a problem. Is not in my research for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, it's <laughs> debated. But uh, I think it's really industry. This analysis is not required. The design is not required by code. So you are, we are not forced to do this. But I say that for some special structures, people are worried about the collapse. Then I think this is the way to go. A lot of structures, my impression is, are cookie cutter. <laughs> I mean, can we, can we appreciate the elegance that he saves so much computer time? That's where the, that's where, that's where the merit is, isn't it? I cannot well, do it simultaneously in two the different parts. <laughs> well, the elegance is great, and, and therefore it should be used more widely. Well, okay. okay, maybe next question. <laughs> Let's move. Thank you, David. Let's move. That would go to the reception. <laughs> uh, first time. Okay. Very nice presentation, Zhao I, If I understood correctly, you said that uh, in your simplified procedure towards the end, that if you remove an element, you can't really represent the redistribution. No. So there are ways that uh, uh, structures nowadays can be uh, configured so that you do have robust, robust load paths. So your model would not be able to distinguish between those, would it? Uh, in the, you mean robustly means the load? Low redistribution pass. I think the model is able to capture the different alternative load paths because once the element failed with different properties, then of course the load distribution will be different in elastic, elastic sense. But the model was not captured as a nonlinear force distribution. That part is missing. But that's we pay the price because we want to be faster. I just have a quick question of clarification and um, is. It looks like in, the, in your um, movies you have some dynamics there. Is the dynamics really in, the, in terms of the collapsing? So there's um, oh, the, the one that you just had Yes, there. this well, one. Well, not necessarily that one, but where you sort of take the column out and, oh, and yeah, of course be where the, the car runs into it. Yes. And then it's a little bit, I mean, so that also involves maybe some time-dependent yeah. stuff. Are, are you re actually resolving that in your model or how does... Uh, for model the simplified model, we don't have dynamics at all because we only look at a non-intact condition. Once the structure starts to collapse, I don't care. It, it's gone. But uh, for the, the first model that uh, we captured the entire collapse, yes, dynamics is there. Yeah. I'll, I can talk to you later. Okay. Uh, I noticed that at the beginning you talked about two models, the FEM model, finite element model, yes. and the discrete element model. Yes. And uh, your model is... I think similar to the discrete element model, and then it's a great simplification. It is. So uh, why did you not use the discrete element model? What aspects of this okay. are there that uh, do not function properly? Just to be frank, the thing I don't like with those models is that the calibration of those springs are unclear to me. You might view that uh, if you have a nonlinear ele element in a structure, and uh, you want to force the damage occur in those elements, this element had to be representing a physical damage in a finite zone. This is missing in all models. They don't care about this. What in those models, those springs between the spheres and those springs are strictly calibrated from material properties, for example, reinforcement, stress ring curve. But in my view that these springs actually represent really a finite zone size. For example, in structural analysis, we know a plastic hinge is not a point. In, real, in calculation, we say the plastic hinge is a point, but if you look at a structure, a plastic hinge is a zone. It cannot be a hinge. So I think, uh, especially for concrete structures, that size is extremely important. That comes back to scaling, but uh, I want to talk about scaling today. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that it really depends on how big the size is, you know, compared to the element size. That gives you different behavior of that zone. And that has to be embedded in those springs, but it's not done. So, so and also that those springs are uncoupled. That's another thing that I think uh, we should have uh, this kind of mixed mode uh, coupled model. 
to capture the in interaction between normal shear directions. I think that is, uh, in my view, probably the, be the better way to go around with this. I think we almost exhausted all that time, and I feel we are up to the discussion. So let's okay. thank the speaker and proceed to the session. All right, thanks.